for us, Brian, who's getting the most donations from U.S. troops? Well, Wolf, the winner by far is the man who has surprised us since this campaign season began with his overall fundraising ability. If you're basing your vote on a candidate's position on Iraq, Ron Paul and Barack Obama won't leave you confused on where they stand. It's unconstitutional. It's an undeclared war. The war in Iraq was unwise. Those blasts could be striking a positive chord within the U.S. military. According to the Center for Responsive Politics, which tracks the government's information on campaign contributions, Ron Paul is by far the leading recipient of cash from current members of the military. Among those who gave more than $200, the group says, Paul brought in more than $210,000 last year. Fellow war opponent Obama is far behind, but places second with more than $94,000. John McCain and Hillary Clinton are an even more distant third and fourth. For the military to be making such a bold statement, uh, at least among the group that is contributing, does say something about their feelings about the, the candidates and about the war. Little less than one year from today, you will go into the voting booth and you will select the next president of the United States of America. I think elections are about the future. But how do you determine what will happen in the future? Well, you have to look to the record. You have to look to what we say in campaigns. Egotism, narcissism, Islamofascism is real. Their goal is to unite the world under a single jihadist caliphate. Use fear and falsehood. My view is we had a double Guantanamo. What do you talk about? When you have nothing to say. This is insane. Some of these people frighten me. They frighten me. President Bush has talked about our saying in Iraq for 50 years. Maybe 100. The danger from Iran is great. Well, I'm not concerned about the voters. It'll be a really nice food cake. But I can't be president unless you choose me to be. And I hope you will. Deficit financing, big government, more taxes, more bureaucracy, more regulations, more policing the world. What are you guys talking about, you know? We must win in Iraq. We're going to have to engage in the Middle East. This is a global effort we're going to have to lead. We will do whatever is necessary. The Iranians could grab the Shia South. We have a new strategy. Very confrontational and very aggressive. There will be chaos that will spread to the region and to the rest of the world. They ultimately want to bring down the United States of America. Congressman Paul, you voted against the war. Why are all your fellow Republicans up here wrong? It is the constitutional position. It is the advice of the founders to follow a non-interventionist foreign policy. Stay out of entangling alliances. Be friends with countries. Negotiate and talk with them and trade with them. So there's a lot of merit to the advice of the founders in following the Constitution. And my argument is that we shouldn't go to war so carelessly. When we do, the wars don't end. Congressman, you don't think that changed with the 9-11 attack, sir? What changed? The non-interventionist policies. No, non-intervention was a major contributing factor. Have you ever read about the reasons they attacked us? They, they attack us because we've been over there. We've been bombing Iraq for 10 years. Are you suggesting we invited the 9-11 attack, sir? I'm, I'm suggesting that we listen to the people who attacked us and the reason they did it. They have already now, since that time, have killed 3,400 of our men, and I don't think it was necessary. Right now, we're building an embassy in Iraq that's bigger than the Vatican. We're building 14 permanent bases. What would we say here if China was doing this in our country or in the Gulf of Mexico? We would be objecting. We need to look at what we do from the perspective of what would happen if somebody else did it to us. That's really an extraordinary statement. It's an extraordinary statement of someone who lived through the attack of September 11, that we invited the attack because we were attacking Iraq. I don't think I've ever heard that before, and I've heard some pretty absurd explanations for September 11. And I, would, I would ask the congressman to withdraw that comment and tell us that he didn't really mean that. Congressman? I believe very sincerely that the, that the CIA is correct when they teach and, and talk about blowback. When we went into uh, Iran in 1953 and installed the Shah, yes, there was blowback. 
uh, the reaction to that was the taking of our hostages, and that persists. And if we ignore that, we ignore that at our own risk. That if we think that we can do what we want around the world and not incite hatred, then we then we have a problem. They don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. Can I have 30 seconds, please? No, 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 no wait a second. Let's all get 30 they're, seconds. They're, they are coming. Oh, 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 we all want 30 seconds. We're we're talking about this. We'll, we'll... Flags are bits of colored cloth that governments use first to shrink wrap people's brains and then as ceremonial shrouds to bury the dead. The U.S. military as an institution is very corrupt and is, is built upon spreading death. To me, the idea of having a force like the U.S. Army participating in nation building is, is just asinine. I mean, we're, we're nation destroyers. That's what we're trained to do. We were all congra congratulated after we had our first kills. Uh, my company commander personally congratulated me. This is the same individual who has stated that whoever gets their first kill by stabbing them to death will get a four-day pass when we return from Iraq. I've heard numerous circumstances of, uh, of civilians getting killed and then um, you know, soldiers and Marines subsequently uh, placing weapons on their bodies or placing wire on them. Army Private First Class Lavina Johnson would have turned 23 this month, but three years ago the African-American teenager from Missouri was found dead in Blotter Rock, just a few weeks short of her 20th birthday. Her body was found in a tent belonging to the private military contractor Kellogg Brown and Root. She had abrasions all over her body, a broken nose, a black eye, burned hands, loose teeth, acid burns on her genitals a bullet hole in her head. The Army labeled Lavina Johnson's death a suicide. They told her parents she died of self-inflicted non-combat injuries. Oh, hey, tell, say it again. Say again what happened. Say what? You know, like, what was going on? What was it like being a guard there? The guard at Apple Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that place, man. It's fucking world famous now. As far as I'm concerned, they're all guilty. You know what? They should have kicked Saddam out themselves. Instead, we're there doing the fucking job. Fuck them, dude. Anyone with a fucking rag on their head is very good. The girl was probably like 15 years old. See him, right? Well, I hadn't like... been touched yet. She was fucking crying. Oh. So, guys, he started pimping her out for 50 bucks a shot. I think at the end of the day, you know, he made like 500 bucks before she hung herself. Really? Four soldiers walked through the trees and approached this house. Here, according to specialist James Barker's statement, he and another soldier took it in turns to rape the 14-year-old girl. In another room, the girl's parents and five-year-old sister were shot dead. Barker's statement said after Green had killed the two adults and the little girl, he came into the room where the teenager was being sexually assaulted. He had an AK-47 rifle in his hand. He said, they're all dead, I killed them. He put the weapon down, raped the 14-year-old, and then shot her dead too. Before they left, they poured kerosene over the girl's body and set it alight. They returned to their checkpoint, and Barker said he grilled some chicken wings. Four years ago, at the age of 19, Ms. Jamie Lee Jones signed a contract to become an employee of KBR, then a Halliburton subsidiary. Ms. Jones arrived in Iraq in July of 2005 and was housed in barracks with 400 men and only a few women. Four days after her arrival, Ms. Jones was drugged and gang raped. After Ms. Jones reported the rape to her supervisors, she was locked in a shipping container with an armed guard and prohibited any contact with the outside world. They locked her in a container. According to the Center for Defense Information, 51% of your federal income taxes go specifically to military spending. Not health care or education, but war. So cute, so cute little puppy. Oh, 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 that's right. Oh. Come on, you're almost there, come on. <laughs> I spoke <don't know. laughs> Why 
I was her child, one of an increasing number born with deformities since the war, like this. Massive growth which was rapidly spreading across the little girl's face. Case after case of differing deformities without any real explanation, except their parents' suspicions that the deformities were caused by chemicals such as white phosphorus used by the Americans during the war. We have an obligation to every last victim of this illegal aggression because all of this carnage has been done in our name. Since World War II, 90% of the casualties of war are unarmed civilians, a third of them children. Our victims have done nothing to us. From Palestine to Afghanistan to Iraq to Somalia to wherever our next target may be, their murders are not collateral damage. They are the nature of modern warfare. They don't hate us because of our freedoms. They hate us because every day we are funding and committing crimes against humanity. The so-called war on terror is a cover for our military aggression to gain control of the resources of Western Asia. This is sending the poor of this country to kill the poor of those Muslim countries. This is trading blood for oil. This is genocide. And to most of the world, we are the terrorists. In these times, remaining silent on our responsibility to the world and its future is criminal. And in light of our complicity in the supreme crimes against humanity in Iraq and Afghanistan and ongoing violations of the UN Charter and international law, how dare any American criticize the actions of legitimate resistance to illegal occupation. Our so-called enemies in Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestine, our other colonies around the world, and our inner cities here at home are struggling against the oppressive hand of empire, demanding respect for their humanity. They are labeled insurgents or terrorists for resisting rape and pillage by the white establishment, but they are our brothers and sisters in the struggle for justice. The civilians at the other end of our weapons don't have a choice, but American soldiers have choices. And while there may have been some doubt five years ago, today we know the truth. Our soldiers don't sacrifice for duty, honor, country. They sacrifice for Kellogg, Brown, and Root. They don't fight for America. They fight for their lives and their buddies beside them because we put them in a war zone. They're not defending our freedoms. They're laying the foundation for 14 permanent military bases to defend the freedoms of ExxonMobil and British Petroleum. They're not establishing democracy. They're establishing the basis for an economic occupation to continue after the military occupation has ended. Iraqi society today, thanks to American help, is defined by house raids, death squads, checkpoints, detentions, curfews, blood in the streets, and constant violence. We must dare to speak out in support of the Iraqi people who resist and endure the horrific existence we brought upon them through our bloodthirsty imperial crusade. We must dare to speak out in support of those American war resistors, the real military heroes who uphold their oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, including those terrorist cells in Washington, D.C., more commonly known as the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. Frederick Douglass said, those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation, are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. Every one of us, every one of us must keep demanding, keep fighting, keep thundering, keep plowing, keep speaking, keep struggling until justice is served. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. NBC News in depth tonight, back to the front. The number of U.S. soldiers who've had their Iraq military service involuntarily extended under the so-called stop loss policy is at its highest since the start of the war. That's despite a Pentagon pledge last year to cut back on its use. When I, when I read the blogs and everything else from, you know, the people who are, you know, involved with the Ron Paul Convention and everything, I want to go and listen to those people, but there's about 10% of that audience that scares the living bejesus out of me. And what's the percentage of Obama and McCain people that scare the living bejesus out of you? 
Like Obama people, 80%. Okay. Oh, McCain people, because, you know, they're all like, <laughs> they're, not, they're not really active. They're just, most of them are asleep. You know, they don't yeah. really scare me. So, uh, so the Ron Paul people aren't doing that bad then, are they? With 10% nuts.